We are going to be continuing with our uh, series on ecclesiology this morning, the doctrine of the church for the second week, and I am delighted that some of you have come back after last week, and some of you have come that weren't here last week that were out of town, so that's a good thing. But uh, I want we're going to be in Colossians, the first chapter, the 12th verse, in just a moment we'll be there if you want to go ahead and find that in your copy of Scripture. Again, just a reminder, if you don't have a copy with you, there should be one in the pew rack there in front of you, uh, and you're welcome to use that, and even if you don't have a copy, take that with you. Uh, that will be the gift from, from this church. But uh, we're going to be looking at qualifications in just a moment, what it means about qualifications for church. And when I, when I think about this, I go back, and obviously when in my former life, I spent most of my life as a young boy, even as an adult, involved with athletics, either attempting to play and attempting to coach. And I spent a lot of my a lot of years doing that. And so I think along those lines many times. And one of my dad and I, my dad was a World War II vet. He was born in 1926. Uh, he was grew up in a depression. He went off to war when he was 17 years old in the Pacific, and uh, with God's grace, he came home and married a, a lady from uh, an American lady who was in Korea her whole life. With growing up with her parents and missionaries there, probably couldn't have had two more opposite people, personality-wise and everything else. But God molded them into a great couple, and I had great parents, and they raised three children and small town America, and he died prematurely, at least in, in my evidence, right after three months after he retired. He passed away as a very young man, uh, especially in my eyes now at 62 years old. And my dad was a typical greatest generation guy. He just was a workaday guy that went to work every day. You could always count on him. If he said it, just considered it done. He never had a lot of opinions. He would keep them to himself. He didn't do, uh, he didn't pontificate. He was not going to be a preacher and would probably be embarrassed at his son, some of the things his son says. But at any rate, he was, he was that typical, prototypical World War II vet. He told me he loved me two times in my life that I can remember. But he showed me that he loved me every day and how He provided for me, how He cared for me, and I knew that. But the thing that kind of bound us together, he, he got me around athletics. That was something that He never had a chance to do. He went to work when He was about 12 years old, given His situation, and that was something that He never had time for. But yet He wanted that for me, and that He saw a bent in that for me, at least a like or a love for that. And so he would get me around. He didn't push. He didn't ram it down my throat. He didn't act like he knew everything. He just gave me opportunities. And one thing we really connected with was NFL football. I'm getting to a point here, so stay with me, all right? But we, we connected with NFL football because his sister, my aunt, lived in Atlanta when the Atlanta Falcons were born in the 1960s. I was just a wee tot. But we, their first training camp was in Black Mountain, North Carolina, where my grandmother lived. And as a very, very young boy, I can barely remember it, he took me up there to see their training, you know, the, the NFL team training camp. And I said, boy, this is neat. And we would go occasionally into Atlanta to see a game. We'd ride the train down, that tells you how long ago it was, and ride the train back that night after the ball game. And it was a... Those are great memories, and that kind of... Now, we never celebrated many wins because this was the Atlanta Falcons, okay? So there wasn't a lot of winning there, but it was a kindred spirit. And one thing, mostly by my prompting as I got older, my dad would just kind of rock along. He wasn't going to instigate anything, but I prompted, and he agreed. I said, we need to go to the NFL Hall of Fame one day to Canton, Ohio. That's what we need to do. He said, yeah, that would be a good trip. And unlike most people, I wasn't hooked on college football. I was hooked on pro football because of my dad. Now, in this day and time, I could care less about either one because it's not a game. It's just a vehicle that a political agenda is moved through. So that's another sermon for another time. But 
at this time, it was all about that NFL and the Hall of Fame. And I used to watch those induction ceremonies every year, late summer. They'll be coming up real soon. And I'd listen to those speeches, and I'd read about the guys that got inducted. And it was such, to, they were always, every one of them, even the arrogant ones back in the day, were humbled by that induction of being chosen for the NFL Hall of Fame mainly because a large part of the votes came from those members who were already in the Hall of Fame. From those, those men that they had grown up idolizing. And it meant something to them. And that they were, they were picked to be a part of that Hall of Fame. That was kind of the ultimate of any sport, of any really industry. All of you, you may not know about the NFL Hall of Fame, but there are Hall of Fames that everybody... Uh, aspires to be to probably depending on who they are and what they are but that is that is very much like the church folks now every analogy anytime you make an analogy it is going to fall down when you compare it to scripture or God's God's word or God's plan but that is in a sense what I want you to think about you don't earn your salvation I don't earn my salvation but God has made a plan for you it is not by accident that you sit in these pews this morning. I tell you that many weeks. But especially this morning, I will tell you that. It's not an accident. You didn't come to be a Christian by an accident. Unlike what other people around the world and what liberal theologians say, it's just, well, you were born in the West, so you were going to be Christian. If you'd been born in the Far East, you'd be a Buddhist. Or whatever, you'd be a Muslim if you were born in Africa. No. That's not God's plan. Sure, there's some figures and some math that goes into that. There's going to be more of a certain religion. But God has a plan. And His plan is ultimately revealed in this doctrine of the church. This ecclesiology that we're talking about. Of the church, His body, His bride, His household. And I, I, am, I am convinced more than I've ever been, I'm going to repeat myself from last week, we do not understand, as the church as a whole, we do not understand the great, great, immense, eternal honor and graciousness that has been given to us that God has placed us in His church. And there is a qualification. Last week we talked about what the church was. That it is a group of people. A group of believers from all time and all periods of history. Even those that are still to come. From every tribe, every nation, and every tongue. That God has redeemed as part of His eternal plan of redeeming a people. That's what God is about. A, a great God. God is a holy and righteous God. And when man fell in the garden, when Adam sinned, and God moved them out of the garden and had the cherubim there at the gate with the sword so they could not get back into paradise, He was, he was just and righteous right there if He had never done another thing. But God wanted to show the world even before Adam and Eve were around, even before the world was around, he had a plan to redeem a people. Folks, you need to let that sink in. You don't need to say, man, I can't believe I'm going to church. He's going to preach on the church. I've been going to church for 50 years. But we have discounted what it means to be a part of God's church. Even in the church, we've done that. And so, unlike a Hall of Fame where we admire the people that might choose us, because of some, some attribute we have or something we've done, God has chosen us to be part of His household just because He's God. And it all goes back to Him. It has nothing to do with us. And that's what I want us to see. And Paul says that many places in his letters. Other writers say it. But I want to focus on this passage in Colossians 1, 12 through 14. We went through Colossians a few years ago, and this became one of my favorite passages here. Colossians 1, verses 12 through 14. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you. Your translation may say who has qualified us. 
to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Pray with me. Father, we come now in this time of worship, giving thanks already for what we have heard read, for what we have heard prayed, for the giving that has taken place, for the worship and praise that has been done through song. But God, we come now to specifically hear from Your Word. And Lord, I pray as we have sung that You will plant it deep in us. That You will plant Your truth in us. And that it might change who we are in a way that we maybe have never experienced. And that all the glory all the greatness, all the attention of that, time, of that act will go to You, Father. We pray that now, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. This passage is very brief. It's very to the point. And we're going to see two things in it about the church. Number one, who is the qualifier? Who makes the qualification? Who makes that determination? And number two, what is the qualification? Very simple. You know the answer to both of those right now. I'm quite certain you do. You know the answers. If I gave you a test, you would get both questions right. But there's a story behind there. There's a deepness that, that all of Scripture talks about that this refers to, but that it talks about. And, and folks, the, God's Word, we've talked about this many times, especially on Wednesday night, but God's Word is unlike any other publication. It's like any other book. There are a lot of great books. You can go in my study and you can see a lot of great books. And, and, and I rely on all of them. There, there are great authors that have written throughout time. Classics from centuries ago that still are being read and should be read because they, they give great truths. But nothing is like the Word of God. And when God said something in His Word, when it was written down, when God revealed it and it was written down, it means something. It's not just a passing thought. It means something. It's heavy. There's a gravity to it. And we need to understand that. I've, getting, I've put a little small list, not an exhaustive list at all, on your sermon insert today of some Scripture that, that will kind of help go along with it. There'll be others. If you go to those Scriptures when you get home, they'll take you to other ones. And the things that we're going to look at today about who the qualifier is and what the qualification is, is going to be some hard Scriptures that I'm going to share with you that, that, that make you kind of cock your head and say, huh? That's what we do in the South. We go, huh? And it makes us scratch our head. But that's a good thing. When we read Scripture, as many of our ladies have learned this past year in their Bible study because I've heard them talking about it and they've come and shared things with me. They have struggled. There have been things that have been hard for them to do and passages that were hard, but they worked through them together. And that's what the church is for, to go to Scripture together. And it's what Scripture is supposed to do. This is the Word of God, folks. It's not Yosemite Sam writing the Bible. It is the Word of God. It has deep meaning. It is God attempting to, not attempting, He is doing it, but He is revealing, a holy righteous God is revealing Himself to a sinful, ugly, inept man. That's a hard chore. But God does it perfectly. But there are things that we need to struggle with. There are things we need to dig into. And we want to look first at this qualifier. And again, this, this struggle over Scripture and this meditating and, and questioning and going to people and saying, what about this? What about that? That's how we grow, folks. That's God feeding us. Remember, we can't just keep drinking milk. What happens to a baby if you never give it anything but milk? 
it's not going to, it won't survive. It can't keep rolling. You've got to start putting some of that cereal in there. And then you start putting food in there that they throw most of it back at you. But eventually they learn how to take their hand and shovel it in. And then if they get really educated, they can use a fork. And they take, and then they can take meat and cut it and put it in and get protein in their bodies. And they grow big and strong like each one of us. It's the same thing spiritually, and Paul talks about that. You can't just keep drinking milk. We've got to dig into the meat of the Word. And I think here's what we're doing today with this qualification. The qualification is salvation. You know that. The theological word like ecclesiology, the theological word is soteriology. Soteriology is the study of salvation, how we're saved. That all comes from the original languages in the Bible. But it's good to know that because that's what we need. We just don't need to say, I got saved. I got saved June 12th, 2004. I got saved. Me and God took care of that. We, we dumbed down God's greatest act of redeeming the people. It is a big deal how God saves us. And we need to understand that because that salvation that has been extended to us is what makes us the church. It's what makes us able to be part of God's church. And there's no higher honor. There's absolutely none to be a part of God's redeemed. And many times as a church, myself included, we just go, oh, yeah, I go to church. I'm a member of such and such church. It is the greatest honor known to mankind in the eternity in, in, in all of history to be a part of God's church. And I want us to see that. So let's look at the qualifier first. And with this we've got and I've made some notes. I won't read all of these to you, but I'm going to read a lot of these scriptures. If you just want to jot down the scripture and then listen. But what, what we have here is we've got two ideas that are really hard for man to come to an intersection with. For some people it's divisive, but it shouldn't be because it exalts the greatness of God. One is God's sovereignty and the other is man's free will. Does man have a free will? Absolutely. Does man have a responsibility? Absolutely. Is man going to be held accountable? Absolutely. Is God sovereign above all things and all people? Absolutely. Is God sovereign over every life? Absolutely. Does God create every life? Absolutely. Does God create every new life in an old life that is dead? The new birth? Absolutely. God does that. Salvation is a work of God, not man. That's what separates us from every world religion. We don't do anything to be saved. If you think you've done something to earn your salvation or to make your salvation take place, I'm, I want to speak to you again in love, but I want to speak truth. You are incorrect. You or nobody else has ever done anything to be saved. You must understand that. That is essential to the Christian faith. And there's reasons for that that we will explore. But let's first look at man's free will. Just a couple of things that we want to talk about. A couple of passages. Romans. Romans 1.16. Again, I told you last week, Romans 1-11 through 11 is, the, is the doctrine of salvation. How God saves man. Romans 1-11. through 11. And he starts off, Paul starts off at the very beginning in Romans 1.16 talking about he wants to go to Rome and visit those Christians. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. To whom? To everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. The Greek meaning the Gentile, meaning us. Everybody else who's not a Jew. It is the power of God for salvation. The Gospel is. God's Word. That's how men are saved. And it is a free offer to all mankind, to everyone who believes. Then we see uh, in Romans 10, 13, in that great passage, remember 9, 10, 11, chapters 9, 10, 11, Romans, in Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then, Paul goes on in chapter 10, verse 14, 
How then who those who haven't heard, how will they know? And he talks about the value of a preacher. They must have a preacher. And then in verse 17 he says, it is for faith comes from hearing. So faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of Christ. That's how man is saved. That's how you were saved. If you're in Christ Jesus this morning, it was done through the Gospel of Jesus Christ. It wasn't done through an event. It wasn't done because of camp. It wasn't done because you had a great mom and daddy. It wasn't done because you came and sat in the pews at Green Pond and went to VBS and Sunday school and Wednesday night and everything else every day, every time, every year. That wasn't why it was done. It was done. That may have been where you heard the gospel, but it was done because the gospel was spoken to you. In essence, in a real quick summary, you are born and dead in your trespasses. You are without hope. And God sent a substitute in the person of Jesus Christ. And the punishment for your sin was heaped on Him, the wrath of God, to kill Him. And His death, His blood, bought your life. That's what the Gospel is. And that is done, as Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8-10, through 10, for by grace you have been saved through what? Faith. And this is not your own doing. It is what? The gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. One of the greatest presentations of the gospel there is. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. The whole 10, 1 through 10. 2, 1 through 10. But that is the truth, folks. That is what we must understand. Even though we have a free will, understand this, we are dead in our sins and trespasses, as Ephesians 2, 1 says. Therefore, every time we make a choice, guess what choice we're going to make? We're going to sin. Anything done outside of faith is sin. No matter if you're going to help somebody and fix their plumbing on their house or re-roof their house or buy groceries for them because they don't have any. If you don't do that to glorify God, it carries no merit in eternity. It must. We are designed to glorify God. I know this might be elementary to, to some of you, but I think we have missed the boat. Now we get to God's sovereignty and the power that He has over us. And we see this early in the church in Acts 2, 47. And God added to their number daily. Remember when they're hearing the, the coming to the apostles, teaching every day and they're praying? And God added to their number daily. Acts 13, Acts 13, 48. If you want to write that down. This is Paul in Pisidia. And when the Gentiles heard this, this meaning the Gospel, they began rejoicing and glorifying. You mean this is for us? The Word of the Lord. And as many were appoint, as were appointed to eternal life believed. As many were as appointed. Now who does that appointment? Who's the qualifier? God the Father. God the Father is the qualifier. And you say, wait a minute, doesn't man have a free will? Isn't man held responsible? If I don't believe in Jesus Christ, if I don't repent and believe, what, what is my fate? My fate is eternal separation from God forever. Otherwise known as hell, where there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. That is the fate for anyone outside who is not in Christ Jesus. Eternal hell. But because I'm a dead man, I can't choose spiritual things. I am spiritually dead because of Adam. He's my first father. Remember all the time we took in the genealogies in Genesis? We were connecting those dots from Adam to Noah and Abraham. We had to connect those because that's our lineage. That's from whom we come. And we are dead in our sins and trespasses. That, folks, is what people don't like. People in the church don't like that. Because, oh, Joe's a good old guy. Oh, Susie, she's a good old gal. 
where being a good old guy or being a good old gal does not give you qualification to be in God's church. It is the requirement is being born again. This qualifier, again, we see in, in John 6, 44. John 6, the Gospel of John. John 6, 44. Jesus talking to the disciples. No one can come to me unless what? Unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. You do not enter salvation. You are not qualified the church unless you have been born again. Unless God has saved you. It does not happen. John 3. Nicodemus comes in the middle of the night to Jesus because he's a Pharisee. He doesn't want anybody to see him there. And he says, how, how does one in, inherit eternal life? How does one come to the kingdom of God? And what does Jesus say? You must be born again. You must be born again. There must be a new birth. On and on it goes throughout Scripture. And then I want to, there's, there's several other Scriptures that we'll talk about, and I'll, I'll be glad to give you a list. But in Romans 8, 28, Romans 8, remember Romans, that great Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation, meaning there's no judgment. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ this morning, there's no judgment coming. You were judged where? On the cross. Your sins were nailed to the cross. That's the purpose of the atoning death of Jesus Christ. You're saved. You have bypassed the wrath of God. It has been appeased. It's changed God's disposition towards you. Any way you want to say it. But there's no judgment coming on you if you're in Christ Jesus this morning. That's how Romans 8 begins. And again, it goes through and talks about being living by the flesh and living by the Spirit. And in Romans 8.8 8 it says, anyone who's in the flesh, they cannot please God. It's impossible to please God if you're in the flesh. If you're thinking about what's going on here and your thoughts are not on what's above, it's not on about God's kingdom, you're not going to please God. If you don't have the Spirit of God in you, you can't please God. And then it goes on and talks about the, the living in the flesh, excuse me, living in the Spirit. And we have victory not to sin anymore. And then it talks about these struggles that we have, the, the momentary afflictions that do not compare with what we're waiting on. And then it talks about the Holy Spirit interceding and taking our groanings and taking them before the Father. And then Romans 8.28. We all know this first part. We all know the first part. And we know that for those who love God, all things what? Work together for good. Now, let's be clear. <laughs> this is God's world. We're living in it. It's not my world. This is not meaning, well, if I just say I love God, then everything's going to work out fine for me. That's not what that's saying. That's saying, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for those who are called according to His purpose. Again, that language of being called, just like Abraham in the Old Testament. God calling us into salvation. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined. For what? To be conformed to the image of His Son in order that He might become the firstborn among many brothers. We are being called into relationship with God so that we look like Jesus Christ. That we're conformed to His image. The old man is being changed and we are looking more and more like Christ. That is the qualifications, folks. And as Paul tells us in Colossians, giving thanks to the Father who's what? who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. He has delivered us, that same Old Testament language coming out of Egypt, just used in Exodus 6. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us. So He's qualified us, He's delivered us, and He's transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is what the church is, folks. It is those people that God has called. God had a plan for you to be His son or daughter. 
I don't want you to miss that, folks. You, it, was, it wasn't because you were just smarter than everybody else. It wasn't because you were in the right place at the right time. This was God's plan. Now, you, wait a minute. You mean man doesn't have a free will? Absolutely. Man has a free will and man is held accountable. Man has responsibility. And I direct you to Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. The secret things of God remain with God. But, but, the things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever that may we do all the works of His law. There's plenty that is plain and simple in God's Word. There's other things where we scratch our head. And those secret things belong to God. But there is plenty where we understand. We understand we're dead in our sins and trespasses. And the only way, the only thing that opens up our heart and our mind is the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Folks, we must understand that. It is not, it is not a series of things that we do or that we may come about. It is the power of God. If you're in Christ Jesus this morning, God has miraculously saved you. You may have grown up sitting in one of these pews your whole life. Your mom and dad or aunt and uncle or grandparents brought you here and you listened to teaching and you heard the Gospel and, you, and God gave you the gift of faith and you repented and believed. It may or not have been a tear shed. There may not have been a big change in your moral living at the time. But it is a work of God. God saves everybody by the same process. He uses different people. He uses different times. But He is bringing it about. All those who were appointed believed. Just like it says in Acts. And this qualification... We don't need to make light of it, folks. Bear with me. The redemption, the forgiveness, being born again. Peter talks about it. 1 Peter 1, 3-5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again. Yeah, we're born again. We repented and believed because God gave that to us. To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the right time, when we take full possession of it. That's 1 Peter 1, 3-5. And then, I want to share with you an article that I read this week. A part, not an article, just a part, a quote. This is from Jim Belief. He's a pastor in Kansas City, Missouri. And he's talking about this, this, not, this misunderstanding of the church, of us not understanding what the church is. And he talks about the great awakening in church history. Every, not just the great awakening that took place in America, but every awakening when there was a pouring out of God's Spirit in a special way, a revival, and many people, hundreds or thousands, or maybe tens of thousands, came to know God. And there have been special movements like that. There have been special times like that. And he's talking specifically about the Great Awakening. And he said, we must begin by answering the above question about the unregenerate church members. In other words, people that are members in churches throughout America that have not been born again. They came because their mom and daddy brought them. They came because it helped their business. They came for a multitude of reasons, but not because they love God not because they are surrendered to God and His Word. We must begin by answering the above question by saying that those church members who profess to know Christ yet do not come to the assembly at all, the gathering that we talked about last week, the gathering of the called out ones, they do not come, or they come occasionally, or, or the main unregenerate. If you believe I'm too acute or too strong by categorizing most non-attending members as unregenerate and think their coming to church is not specifically given in Scripture as a mark of the Christian. Consider what failure to come to the gathering means. Real quickly, listen to this. A couple of things. It tells us that somebody who says they're a Christian, but they never darken the door of the church fellowship. They do not love their brothers. 
because Scripture commands us to come together in love and good deeds. They do not need the teaching of the Bible. They do not love or relish corporate worship of God, of joining together with each other and singing praises to God, or acknowledge the submission to God-ordained leadership to the spiritual leaders of the church. In general, the one who does not come says that the environment of believers is not his preferred environment, perhaps because he's more satisfied with the world. Now folks, I told you last week, and I'll tell you this week, and I'll tell you every week, I am going to deliver from God's Word some strong words when we talk about the church. And I am praying each week, every day each week, that I deliver it with truth, but I also deliver it with grace and love. Because ultimately, I'm responsible for the shepherding of your souls. I'm going to be held accountable to that. And if I tell you what you want to hear, and it's not what God's Word says, I'm going to be held accountable by a holy, righteous God for that. And I'm not willing to do that. I have been called to pastor you, to shepherd you, and I think one of the greatest misunderstandings, not just the Green Pond Baptist Church, and certainly not many of you that are here this morning, but for the church in general, at least in our culture, is that we do not understand what we're a part of. It is not the Lions Club. It is not the Rotary Club. It is not something where we come when we feel like it. Now, if you're sick, I understand that. Y'all don't, don't take me to task on everything. Let's, let's be understanding in this. It's not just if I don't feel well, I don't come, or I've got something else to do. It is a priority. And, and our, our brothers and sisters around the world that are in grave danger, danger of losing their lives, they are attending. They're going to the gathering, knowing that they may be killed, or at least imprisoned for doing that. And I have been guilty in my life of saying, I had a tough night last night. I was up a little late. Oh boy, it was a bad week at work. I think I'm going to stay home. This is the church. These, you are part of the called out ones of Jesus Christ. That God had a plan for you. The, the eternal plan of God Almighty was to bring you into His household. And we're going to say, I don't really feel like being there. Or the music really wasn't good last week. And certainly not the preaching. That is not what the church is, folks. Yes, I'm preaching to the choir because here you sit in the gathering. And many of you, as I look around, are here every week. But it is a command from God Almighty to not forsake the gathering together of ourselves to worship Him because He is worthy of worship. And that's what we were created to do. To do that individually, but also do that corporately. And there is nothing else that the church has been tasked to do can be done until this is done correctly. Until this hour is done correctly. Nothing else can be done by the church. As we'll see in the next few weeks. I want to close with Ephesians. Again, Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. In Him, meaning Jesus Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the richness of His grace, which He lavished upon us all in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will that we talked about last week, according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in heaven, things in, all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. God Almighty, God the Father had a plan for you that He would send His Son, God in the form of Jesus Christ, that He would come, that He would come and be your substitute so that you might be a member of the household of God. What a blessed and gracious and life-changing gift that is. My prayer is that we will understand that more in the days ahead than we have in the past. Join me as we pray. 
Father, I pray now that your word that we have heard from you, that you will use it to penetrate our heart, God, that we will... God, I pray personally and I pray for us as a body that you will stir in us an appreciation as much as possible in our human minds for what you have done for us. And that, that we'll be able to, to transfer ourselves just as you transferred us from darkness to light and to the kingdom of your Son that we will transfer ourselves out of the cultural expectations of church, of the gathering, and understand the purpose that You have commanded it, Lord. So not only that we might please and honor You, but that our lives might be full and abound even in this world. And we pray this in Jesus' name.